here we are at home. Frankie is playing. Frankie, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you tired? No, don't do that. Don't be a crybaby head. No, don't be a crybaby head. No, be a sweetie head. Yeah. No, sweetie head. Oh. You want me to come get you? You want me to come get you? Hmm? Do you? You want me to come get you? Or you just want me to talk to you? Get you or talk? Let's try talk. What did you do today? Oh. What else? So you slept? And you went party, and you ate. Alex is loud, isn't he? Yeah, that's annoying to hear his voice, isn't it? No. Oh, Frankie. Oh, not that. No, not that face. <clears throat> Sounds like they're coming. <clears throat> Y'all just gonna watch. For us, Sean? Yeah. For sure. One of them. You get one taco. Just kidding. There's Steven. Let's eavesdrop. Okay, Frankie, I'm gonna come get you. I'm gonna come get you. Oh, no. Okay, that's enough torture. Here we are. I have her. Hi. Hi, Frankie. Do you know where he's going in Arkansas? Look. Nope. Look at yourself. Arkansas. You can see yourself. Look. Of all places to go. Look. Well, he's going with some other people. You see? Because he loves college. Yeah, that's you. Isn't that weird? You can see yourself. Yeah, that's you. I tried to show her the mirror, but she didn't like that as much. She likes to see herself on TV. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't? <laughs> wow. You can't you take your eyes off finish. yourself, can you? No. You can't. Did your cutie head. This mini is ridiculous. Well, what kind of kid is my double chin? Ribs? Do you have a double chin? Let's see. No? You have a double thing on your neck, though. See? Yeah. There it is. Do you want to touch it? What kind of kid is going to be fooled into thinking that fruit cup is a dessert? Laugh at that thing. And let's raise that one. Laugh at that baby. No fruit for you. Yeah. This is special. This is special, baby. Yeah.
Frankie. Say hi to 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 Frankie. Alright, let's reposition. I might go. I'm not sure. We're back to video land. I'm sitting down. Frankie just loves to see herself. She's drooling. All over herself. You think she see that a picture that small? Yeah. I think she can. Oh, we need to raise it up a little. Mm-hmm. Not sure she said oh. anything specific. Mm-mm. She just says real thank you. You sit like a lady. <laughs> you ain't playing any pictures with you. You sit like a lady, Missy. Rubber, 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 rubber. Get him. Get him. Ew. We're going to read a story. Hi. Hi. Now what have you been saying? We're going to read a story. <laughs> Dance at Grandpa's. <clears throat> Monday morning, everybody got up early in a hurry to get started to Grandpa's. Pa wanted to be there to help with the work of gathering and boiling the sap. Ma would help Grandma and the ants make good things to eat for all the people who were coming to the dance. Breakfast was eaten and the dishes washed and the beds made by lamplight. Pa packed his fiddle carefully in its box and put it in the big sled. Girl, sit up. We're trying to read. You need to sit up. Don't be doing that. There ain't nothing over there. Sit up. Do your schoolwork. The air was cold and frosty and the light was gray. When Laura, Mary, and Ma with baby Carrie were tucked in snug and warm under the robes of the straw in the bottom of the sled. The horses shook their heads and pranced, making the sleigh bells ring merrily. And away they went on the road through the big woods to Grandpa's. The snow was damp and smooth in the road, so the sled slipped quickly over it, and the big trees seemed to be hurrying by on either side. After a while, there was sunshine in the woods and the air sparkled. The long streaks of yellow light lay between the shadows of the tree trunks, and the snow was colored faintly pink. All the shadows were thin and blue, and every little curve of snowdrifts, and every little track in the snow had a shadow. Pa showed Laura the tracks of the wild creatures in the snow at the sides of the road. The small leaping tracks of cottontail rabbits, the tiny tracks of field mice, and the feathery, stitchy tracks of snowbirds. Uh, ow. <laughs> there were larger tracks, like dog tracks, where foxes had run, and there were tracks of a deer that had bounded away into the woods. The air was growing warmer already, and Pa said that the snow wouldn't last long. It did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house. All right, special delivery. Ow! For pain! Ow! Don't Mom hit her, her with this! Mama Mama Make it stop! Mama hit her funny bow. Mama hit her funny it's bow. It's funny. Oh, yeah, she's crying for you. She's I crying know. about your funny bow. Give me shoot. <coughs> Give me shoot. I don't. <laughs> 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 don't record me. Uh, okay, it's not on. The air was growing warmer already, and Pa said that the snow wouldn't last long. See? It did not seem long. God says, Thou shalt not bear fruit. The R E C <laughs> means record. <laughs> Stop! 
please don't record. Are you going to breastfeed now? Yes, I'm going to breastfeed. <laughs> She's going to suck the liquid out of me. So if you can please not record it, I would appreciate it. Okay, that. not on you. Gosh. Not during the dangerous initial maneuvers. There were larger tracks like dog tracks where foxes had run. And there were the tracks of a deer that had bounded away into the woods. The air was growing warm already and Paul said that the snow wouldn't last long. It did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing of, at Grandpa's house. All the sleigh bells jingling. Grandma came to the door and stood there smiling, calling to them to come in. She said that Grandpa and Uncle George were already at work out in, in the maple woods. So Pa went to help them, while Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, went to Grandma's house and took off their wraps. Laura loved Grandma's house. It was much larger than their house at home. There was one great big room, and then there was a little room that belonged to Uncle George. And there was another room for the aunts, Aunt Dorcia and Aunt Ruby. And then there was the kitchen with the big cook stove. It was fun to run the whole length of the big room from the large fireplace at one end all the way to Grandma's bed under the window in the other end. The floor was made of wide, thick slabs that Grandpa had hewed from the logs with his axe. <laughs> the floor was smoothed God, all over and scrubbed clean and white. And the big bed under the window was soft with feathers. The day seemed very short while Laura and Mary played in the big room. Look at how and Ma helped does. Grandma and aunts in the kitchen. The men had taken their dinners to the maple like woods, so for dinner they did not set the table, but ate cold venison sandwiches and drank milk. But for supper, Grandma made hasty pudding. She stood by the stove, sifting the yellow cornmeal from her fingers into a kettle of boiling salted water. She stirred the water all the time with a big spoon and sifted in the meal until the kettle was full of a thick yellow bubbling mass. Then she set it on the back of the stove where it would cook slowly. It smelled good. The whole house smelled good with the sweet and spicy smells from the kitchen, the smell of the hickory logs burning with clear bright flames in the fireplace, and the smell of a clove apple beside Grandma's mending basket on the table. The sunshine came in through the sparkling window panes and everything was large and spacious and clean. At supper time, Paul and Grandpa came from the woods. Each had on his shoulders a wooden yoke that Grandpa had made. It was kept to fit around their necks and the back and hollowed out to fit over their shoulders. From each end hung a chain with a hook and on each hook hung a big wooden bucket full of hot maple syrup. Thank you. Sorry, I had a booger on my finger. Can I see what it looks like? So pa and Grandpa had brought the syrup from the big kettle into the woods. They steadied the buckets with their hands, but the weight hung from the yokes on their shoulders. Grandma made room for the, a huge brass kettle on the stove. Pa and Grandpa poured the syrup into the brass kettle, and it was so large that it held all the syrup from the four big buckets. Then Uncle George came with a smaller bucket of syrup, and everybody ate the hot, hasty pudding with maple syrup for supper. Uncle George was home from the Army. He wore his blue Army coat with the brass buttons, and he had bold, merry blue eyes. He was big and broad, and he walked with a swagger. Laura looked at him all the time she was eating her hasty pudding, because she had heard Pa say to Ma that he was wild. George is wild since he came back from the war, Pa had said, shaking his head as if he were sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Uncle George had run away to be a drummer boy in the army when he was 14 years old. Laura had never seen a wild man before. She did not know whether she was afraid of Uncle George or not. When supper was over, Uncle George went outside the door and blew his army bugle, long and loud. It made a lovely ringing sound far away through the big woods. The woods were dark and silent. The trees stood still as though they were listening. Then from very far away, the sound came back, thin and clear and small like a little bugle answering the big one. Listen, Uncle George said, isn't that pretty? Laura looked at him, but she did not say anything. And when Uncle George stopped blowing the bugle, she ran into the house. Ma and Grandma cleared away the dishes and washed them and swept the hearth, while Aunt Docia and Aunt Ruby made themselves pretty in their room. Laura sat on their bed and watched them comb out their long hair and part it carefully. They parted it from their foreheads to the napes of their necks and then they parted it across from ear to ear. They braided their their back hair in long braids. That sounds like they had hair on their back head. Back hair. 
<laughs> they braided their back hair in long braids, and they, then they did the braids up carefully in big knots. They had washed their hands and faces and scrubbed them well with soap. At the wash basin on the bench in the kitchen, they had used store soap, not the slimy, soft, dark brown soap that Grandma made and kept in a big jar to use for common every day. They fussed for a long time with their front hair, holding up the lamp and looking at their hair in the little looking glass that hung on the log wall. They brushed it so smooth on each side of the straight white part that it shone like silk in the lamplight. The little puff on each side shone too, and the ends were coiled and twisted neatly under the big knot in the back. Then they pulled on their beautiful white stockings that they had knit of fine cotton thread and lace, open patterns, and they buttoned up their best shoes. They helped each other with their corsets. Aunt Dosia pulled as hard as she could on Aunt Ruby's corset strings, and then Aunt Dosia hung on to the foot of the bed while Aunt Ruby pulled on hers. Pull, Ruby, pull, Aunt Dosia said, breathless. Pull harder, so Aunt Ruby braced her feet and pulled harder. Aunt Dosia kept measuring her waist with her hands, and at last she gasped, I guess that's the best you can do. She said, Caroline says Charles could span her waist with his hands when they were married. Caroline was Laura's mom, and when she w w and when she heard this, Laura felt proud. Then Aunt Ruby and Aunt Dosia put on their flannel petticoats and their plain petticoats and their stiff starched white petticoats with knitted lace all around the flounces. They put on their beautiful dresses. Aunt Dosia's dress was sprigged print, dark blue with sprigs of red flowers and green leaves thick upon it. The basque was buttoned down the front with black buttons, with, which looked so exactly like juicy big black berries that Laura wanted to taste them. Aunt Ruby's dress was wine-colored calico, covered all over with a feathery pattern and lighter wine color. It buttoned with gold-colored buttons, and every button had a little castle and a tree carved on it. Aunt Dosia's pretty white collar was fastened in front with a large, round cameo pin, which had a lady's head on it. But Aunt Ruby pinned her collar with a red rose made of sealing wax. She had made it herself on the head of a darning needle, which had a broken eye, so it couldn't be used as a needle anymore. They looked lovely, sailing over the floor so smoothly with their large, round skirts. Their little waist rose up tight and slender in the middle, and their cheeks were red and their eyes bright under the wings of shining, sleek hair. Ma was beautiful, too, in her dark green delaine with the little leaves that looked like strawberries scattered over it. The skirt was ruffled and flounced and draped and trimmed with knots of dark green ribbon. And nestling at her throat was a gold pin. The pin was flat, as long and as wide as Laura's two big fingers. And it was carved all over and scalloped on the edges. Ma looked so rich and fine that Laura was afraid to touch her. People had begun to come. They were coming on foot through the snowy woods with their lanterns. And they were driving up to the door in sleds and in wagons. Sleigh bells were jingling all the time. The big room filled with tall boots and swishing skirts, and ever so many babies were lying in a row in Grandma's bed to see everybody brought their babies and put them in Grandma's bed. Uncle James and Aunt Libby had come with their little girl, whose name was Laura Ingalls, too. The two Laurels leaned on the bed and looked at the babies, and the other Laura said her baby was prettier than baby Carrie. She is not either, Laura said. Carrie is the prettiest baby in the whole world. No, she isn't, the Laura other said. Yes, she is. No, she isn't. Ma came sailing over in her fine delay and said severely, Laura. So neither Laura said anything more. Uncle George was blowing his bugle and made a loud ringing sound in the big room. And Uncle George joked and laughed and danced, blowing the bugle. Then Pa took his fiddle out of its box and began to play and all the couples stood in squares on the floors and began to dance when Pa called the figures. Grand right and left, Pa called out, and all the skirts began to swirl, and all the boots began to stamp. The circles went round and round, all the skirts going one way, and all the boots going the other way, the hands clasping and parting high up in the air. Swing your partners, Pa called, and each gent bowed to the lady on the left. They all did this, as Pa said. Laura watched Ma's skirt swaying and her little waist bending and her dark head bowing, and she thought Ma was the loveliest dancer in the world. The fiddle was singing. 
Oh, you buffalo gals, aren't you coming out tonight? Aren't you coming out tonight? Aren't you coming out tonight? Oh, you buffalo girls, aren't you coming out tonight? To dance by the light of the moon. The little circles and the big circles went round and round. And the skirts swirled and the boots stamped and partners bowed and separated and met and bowed again. In the kitchen, Grandma was all by herself, stirring the boiling syrup in the big brass kettle. She stirred in time to the music. By the, t by the back door was a pail of clean snow. And sometimes Grandma took a spoonful of syrup from the kettle and poured it on some of the snow in a saucer. Laura watched the dancers again. Pa was playing the Irish washerwoman now. He called, do -si do ladies, do -si do Come down heavy on your heel and toe. Laura could not keep her feet still. I, I Uncle George run. looked at her and laughed. Then he caught her by the hand and did a little dance with her in the corner. She liked Uncle George. Everybody was laughing over by the kitchen door. They were dragging Grandma in from the kitchen. Grandma's dress was beautiful, too. A dark blue calico with autumn-colored leaves scattered over it. Her cheeks were pink from laughing, and she was shaking her head. The wooden spoon was in her hand. I can't leave the syrup, she said. But Pa began to play the Arkansas Traveler, and everybody began to clap in time to the music. So Grandma bowed to them all and did a few steps by herself. She could dance as prettily as any of them. The clapping almost drowned the music of Pa's fiddle. Suddenly, Uncle George did a pigeon wing, and bowing low before Grandma, he began to jig. Grandma tossed her spoon to somebody. She put her hands on her hips and faced Uncle George, and everybody shouted. Grandma was jigging. Laura clapped her hands in time to the music with all the other clapping hands. The fiddle sang as it had never sung before, and Grandma's eyes were snapping, her cheeks were red, and underneath her skirts, her heels were clicking as fast as the thumping of Uncle George's boots. Everybody was excited. Uncle George kept on jigging, and Grandma kept on facing him jigging, too. And the fiddle did not stop, and Uncle George began to breathe loudly, and he wiped sweat off his forehead, and Grandma's eyes twinkled. You can't beat her, George, somebody shouted. Uncle George jigged faster. He jigged twice as fast as he'd been jigging. So did Grandma. Everybody cheered again. All the women were laughing and clapping their hands, and all the men were teasing George. George did not care, but it, he did not have enough breath to laugh. He was jigging. Pa's blue eyes were snapping and sparkling. He was standing up, watching George and Grandma, and the bow danced over the fiddle strings. Laura jumped up and down and squealed and clapped her hands, and Grandma kept on jigging. Her hands were on her hips, and her chin was up, and she was smiling. George kept on jigging, but his boots did not thump as loudly as they had thumped at first. Grandma's heels kept on clickety-clacketing gaily. A drop of sweat dripped off George's forehead and shone on his cheek. All at once, he threw up both arms and gasped. I'm beat. He stopped jigging. Everybody made a terrific noise, shouting and yelling and stamping, cheering Grandma. Grandma jigged just a little minute more, then she stopped. She laughed and gasped. Her eyes sparkled just like Pa's when he laughed. George was laughing too and wiping his forehead on his sleeve. Suddenly, Grandma stopped laughing. She turned and ran as fast as she could into the kitchen. The fiddle had stopped playing. All the women were talking at once and all the men were teasing George, but everybody was still for a minute when Grandma looked like that. Then she came to the door between the kitchen and the big room and said, the syrup is waxing. Come and help yourselves. Then everybody began to talk and laugh. They all hurried to the kitchen for plates and outdoors to fill the plates with snow. The kitchen door was open and the cold air came in. Outdoors, the stars were frosty in the sky and the air nipped Laura's cheeks and nose. Her breath was like smoke. She and the other Laura and all the other children scooped up clean snow with their plates. Then they went back into the crowded kitchen. Grandma stood by the brass kettle and with the big wooden spoon, she poured hot syrup on each plate of snow. It cooled into soft candy, and as fast as it cooled, they ate it. They could eat all they wanted, for maple sugar never hurt anybody. There was plenty of syrup in the kettle, plenty of snow outdoors. As soon as they ate one plate full, they filled their plates with snow again, and Grandma poured more syrup on it. When they'd eaten the soft maple candy until they could eat no more of it, then they helped themselves from the long table loaded with pumpkin pies, dried berry pies, 
cookies, and cakes. There was salt rising bread too, and cold boiled pork, and pickles. Oh, how sour those pickles were. They all ate till they could hold no more. And then they began to dance again, but Grandma watched the syrup in the kettle. Many times she took a little of it out into the saucer and stirred it round and round. Then she shook her head and poured the syrup back into the kettle. The other room was loud and merry with the music of the fiddle and the noise of the dance. At last, as Grandma stirred, the syrup in the saucer turned into little grains like sand. And Grandma called, Quick, girls, it's graining. Aunt Ruby and Aunt Dosia and Ma left the dance and came running. They set out pans, big pans and little pans, and as fast as Grandma filled them with the syrup, they set out more. They set the filled ones away to cool into maple sugar. Then Grandma said, Now bring the patty pans for the children. There was a patty pan, or at least a broken cup or saucer, for every little girl and boy. They all watched anxiously while Grandma ladled the syrup, out the syrup. Perhaps there would not be enough, then somebody would have to be unselfish and polite. There was just enough syrup to go around. The last scrappings of the brass kettle exactly filled the very last patty pan. Nobody was left out. The fiddling and dancing went on and on. Laura and the other Laura stood around and watched the dancers. Then they sat down on the floor in a corner and watched. The dancing was so pretty and the music was so gay that Laura knew she could never get tired of it. All the beautiful skirts went swirling by and the boots went stamping and the fiddle kept on singing gaily. Then Laura woke up and she was lying across the foot of Grandma's bed. It was morning. Ma and Grandma and Baby Carrie were in the bed. Pa and Grandpa were sleeping rolled up in blankets on the floor by the fireplace. Mary was nowhere in sight. She was sleeping with Aunt Dosia and Aunt Ruby in their bed. Soon everybody was getting up. There were pancakes and maple syrup for breakfast. And then Pa brought the horses and the sled to the door. He helped Ma and Carrie in while Grandpa picked up Mary and Uncle George, picked up Laura, and they tossed them over the edge of the sled into the straw. Pa tucked